Welcome back to The Close. Central banks worldwide are moving towards lower borrowing costs. Canada, of course, has already cut interest rates twice. There are big implications for the real estate sector, not just private real estate, but also the public markets. Now, over the past five years, global REITs have underperformed global stocks. However, our guest says we may be at an inflection point. Let's bring in Corrado Russo, Managing Partner and Head of Global Securities at Hazelview Investments. Thanks very much for coming on the show. It's almost a given that real estate profits come under... Oh, I'm sorry. Are we... I think we have got completely mixed up there. And uh, let's... I, I think we'll jump. Uh, Bruce Curran joins us now, Associate Professor of Law at the University of Manitoba. Bruce, you justifiably look baffled there. I'm very sorry. <laughs> uh, I was jumping ahead to a guest who is coming. Um, thank you very much for joining us. You have written an op-ed saying, yes, the federal government bears some responsibility here. Not, not because it has failed to intervene, in the dispute, but you say Ottawa has been too slow to implement a clear standard on worker fatigue in the rail industry. Can you explain what you mean? Yes, I uh, would be uh, would be happy to. So, um, interestingly, and in semi fairness to the government, they did update some safety regulations. I would argue that they are not kind of comprehensive or adequate. And it appears like the workers in the union are definitely arguing or are claiming the same thing. But in 2020, they did uh, bring in a set of what is called duty and rest period rules for railway operating employees. Now, that is only for a specific group of operating employees. It is not for all rail employees that are in a safe in safety sensitive positions um and they uh, so that was implemented in or brought in in 2020 but it was a phased implementation for the railways from 2022 to 2024. now one of the things that is a, a bit interesting is that the the federal government really implicitly acknowledges that these are not adequate because they are uh, have immediate they immediately after implementing the these rules put forward the concept of introducing what's called fatigue management system regulations and these regulations went through they went through a stakeholder consultation phase that ended in 2022 and they were supposed to basically provide draft regulations for stakeholders to react to. Uh, they have not produced those yet, and they will not be, uh, there, there's no kind of immediate plan to release them. They've suggested that they'll be released in 2025. Had those been in place, my argument is that almost certainly this uh, labor disruption would have been averted. That's interesting. It would have given a, a framework for reaching agreement much more easily. Correct. And it would really have meant that the parties themselves would not have to negotiate over safety, right? That this would really, in effect, form part of their agreement or part of the uh, the arrangement in terms of how the railways basically um, run the, the kind of the railway and the working conditions for the workers. We heard from Professor, Professor Rafael Gomez of the U of T earlier, and we may yeah. be talking at cross purposes here, but he argued one problem is that the railroads operate very different types of lines and different standards are, are required for different um, aspects of their operation. Yes, well, and I think that's true. Um, and one of the advantages, I think, to these um, fatigue management system regulations is that it would allow flexibility within certain uh, frameworks for uh, for those things, right? And so one of the things I think that is necessary for public safety is that you can never wholly discount the need for certain kind of fatigue provisions wherever you are, but the consequences of problems are far more serious for some routes carrying certain things than they are for others. And therefore, it is appropriate to leave some room to, uh, to negotiate the, or to basically decide certain of these rules, but that the fatigue management system regulations would provide a framework within which to do that, whereas now there is not an adequate framework. 
Is it fair to say that over the past decade and more, the railroads have become more and more uh, um, focused on profit and pressure on workers has increased? Uh, yes, I think that's fair to say. And it's also fair to say that they have kind of under, uh, you know, th they've laid off many workers, so they have a, a far more lean workforce now than they did before, but their coverage obviously has not gone down. And so this does create an uncomfortable equation where they need to get more out of fewer workers. And that, I mean, the, the unions say that they're concerned about safety. I mean, is that a cover for really just trying to get more money or? Uh, so I, I don't think so. Uh, now, I mean, it, it's a fair question. I mean, really, there is a uh, like compensation is obviously as with any negotiations, it is a subject of negotiation here. My suspicion, though, is that it is more in the way of kind of earnestness than you might anticipate, uh, in part because workers have been uh, swept up in, like they're over the last, let's say, uh, since 1990, there has been 30 major rail accidents in Canada. And, uh, you know, worker fatigue has been the, at least a contributing factor in almost all of them. And workers tend to get kind of blamed or put in the crosshairs of that. And so this is part of what they are trying to forestall by virtue of these improved safety regulations. So there, yes, there is uh, an element of self-interest here of you know, like their working conditions would be better if the safety, uh, if these safety regulations were were implemented. But it's the happy coincidence of it also is important for public safety. Just very quickly, if I could, what are your thoughts on the, the legality or the advisability of the government um, either passing back to work legislation or ordering binding arbitration if it could do that? I, 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 could you start off with the latter? Can the government just order binding arbitration? So um, the the short answer is that it's complicated, uh, but probably. Uh, and so what I think we'll likely see is that I, I would um, argue that it is within, it's not 100% clear, but it is within the government's legal power to order binding, uh, or order binding arbitration on this. They, I think that they've been wise to this point not to, uh, but I think that under uh, Section 107 of the Canada Labour Code, that they do have that, uh, I, I would argue that they do have that authority. The workers and the union, for their part, may argue that there are constitutional problems with that, but I think based on the jurisprudence that it, it is it's a murky area but it, it is justifiable and i think in light of the kind of very serious economic consequences that we are uh, experiencing and obviously the longer this goes the worse the worse it gets that it is uh, likely kind of you know like advisable for the federal government to do that uh, and I think it's a way more justifiable from a legal standpoint uh, uh, standpoint then to uh, you know, implement back to work legislation because that is uh, much less justifiable based on the uh, kind of current right to strike and right to collectively bargain jurisprudence in Canada.